So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, so what I would like to talk about is um, some of the lessons that we learned. Uh, so the Triple O project, I'll get a little bit into the details of what Triple O is. But what we're going to try to present today is um, some of the lessons we've learned uh, while trying to containerize OpenStack as part of the Triple uh, O deployment tool that um, some of us actually work on. Um, as, um, well, before we get there, actually. Um, so this is me, one of us younger and naive. I'm not just naive. Um, thank you all uh, again for being here. I work at Red Hat. Um, that, is, that is my Twitter handler. If, if you, if, I love feedback, so if you like the presentation, I know the app has, a, has some ways to provide feedback, but if you prefer to tweet me or email me, uh, that is my Twitter handler and that is my email. Um, if you don't like the presentation, that is not my Twitter handler and that is definitely not my email, and you can, you can forget I was here. Uh, but jokes apart, like really, like if, if there's anything that you um, would like to provide, even if there's missing content because you did it as well and it turns out that you did it better than, um, than what we actually did, um, I want to know that. So by all means, feel free to contact me. Um, I'll, I look forward to that. Um, Couple of um, disclaimers. Um, I, I, I tend to speak really fast, so um, I'm sorry in advance. Um, I'll try not to drop any F bombs during my presentation, um, but that might happen. And the last disclaimer is that um, what this presentation actually is, is a whole, again, like a whole bunch of um, things that we learned that I kind of like dumped into slides um, in really short statements, and I'll try to explain those to you. Um, but you don't really have to follow them all. They actually just, they worked for us, um, but they might actually not work for you. So if there's, again, if there's anything missing here, by all means, um, do let us know. So um, Triple O, uh, you probably saw me adding this slide like in the last 30 seconds before we started the presentation because I realized that I had a whole bunch of slides explaining what we learned and there was no slide actually explaining what Triple O is, and some of you might actually not know what Triple O is. So Triple O is, um, it stands for OpenStack on OpenStack. It is a deployment tool that uses OpenStack services where it's possible um, to um, deploy um, OpenStack as well. It is, it is, um, it is a, an upstream project. It is, it is an official OpenStack project, an official um, deployment tool that you can use if you want. And, um, yeah, and that is, I think, as much as I want to say about Triple O, because I would like this presentation to be as agnostic about Triple O as possible, and more about the things that you might want to consider when putting OpenStack in containers. Um, so first and foremost, the why. Um, I'll, I'll go through like three or four motivations or things that actually motivate us to, um, to, to start doing this job here, this work here. So this deploying OpenStack, first and foremost, I believe, deploying OpenStack is relatively easy, really. Um, and the real hard work comes on day two operations when you have to keep OpenStack running. Um, so you know, whenever you have to upgrade OpenStack, whenever you have to um, do some changes or just have your users actually using OpenStack, and so you, you gotta maintain the life cycle of OpenStack. That is that is the hard part. So this is one of the things that uh, we kind of like kept in mind when um, kind of like diving into this topic and, and figuring out whether this was something that we really wanted to do or not. Uh, so one thing we uh, we would like to achieve by doing this is service isolation. So being able to have services, OpenStack services, or like any other service that OpenStack depends on as isolated as possible from the rest of the cluster so that we can have um, more, I guess, granular control um, on, on the services and the way that we deploy those and the way that we run those. Um, so service isolation and, and the dependencies isolation, so each one of these services that, uh, that we install, either OpenStack services or other third-party services, they come with a set of dependencies that they have that we also wanted to isolate so that whenever there is an upgrade in process, uh, we won't be updating dependencies that other services um, you know, might still uh, be depending on and probably breaking our environment. So these are all things that you might have heard already many times when it comes to pitching containers. But uh, again, like this is actually uh, stuff that we would like to achieve in our deployment and that we believe it is beneficial for, for OpenStack deployments. 
Ease of upgrades, uh, again, many things we've heard before about um, uh, and all the, the, when, when people pitch containers, but um, it, does e it does make our, the upgrades somewhat easier. Not, not, it does not solve all the upgrades problem. There are many upgrades problem in, in that you need to face or that you will face whenever you try to upgrade OpenStack. But it solves some of the problems when it comes to getting the whole package, getting the isolated service and actually uh, running it and moving from, from one of the processes to another. Um, and if you do it in like a more distributed fashion, it doesn't like I'm not, I've, I've not talked about um, whether you're using Docker or some COE um, or what um, you know container runtime you're you're depending on, but uh, depending on what container runtime you're using or whether you use a COE or not, it might also make you know um, your your upgrades are more dynamic and and easy to to scale by using the uh, orchestration capabilities of that COE. And it provides also some deployment flexibility. So if you, are, if you use the COE in this case, more specifically like Kubernetes, for instance, then you have, you wouldn't be tying. So what, what we do right now, we have like very specific nodes that are used for, uh, for very specific services, and those are pretty tight, right? So if you use uh, COE or like Kubernetes, that you have some extra flexibility because you can let the, the you can let um, Kubernetes orchestrate these services for you based on the way you label and the way you um, you create your cluster. And like, you know, like what I, I understand, like what, some of the things that I'm saying here might be like oversimplifying the whole progress, the the, the whole process. Um, but just bear in mind that the the high level feature that we actually want to gain from from uh, from doing this and. And the ease of scalability, and again, like once you have, if if if, we, if you run this on a on Kubernetes or you run uh, OpenStack on some other um, container runtime, and you have the tools for for um, scaling uh, your nodes, it'll make easier to it'll be easier for you to just tell the COE to go ahead and and scale your services and add more containers to your entire infrastructure, and. Again, like it is not as simple to scale Nova Compute, and we know that. But for the rest of the API services and some of the controller services, um, it does make it simpler to actually add more nodes to your to your cluster. So these are our probably main reasons. Um, hopefully, I'm not forgetting um, any any obvious reason. But this is probably the main reason that why we 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 started like diving more into this. Uh, besides all the um, feedback from users and people that are actually interested in, in, in running OpenStack on containers because it is, they believe it is um, it runs better based on their own experiments and and, and deployments. So um, once you've answered whether you, you know why you want to do the whole thing and why you want to t go down this road, um, the other things that we need to answer and this is a question that we uh, we kind of like faced ourselves is is what exactly we want to containerize. Um, so OpenStack is not OpenStack is not just like a set of APIs. There's a whole bunch of other pieces that come into play whenever uh, you deploy an OpenStack cluster. And there's all the OpenStack services. There's all the, the libraries and dependencies that OpenStack services depend on. There's all the third-party services that OpenStack uh, depends on, like databases, uh, message keys, et cetera. Um, and uh, like even libvirt or like an OpenV switch. Like all these things and tools and um, third-party um, software that OpenStack actually depends on to, to, to work properly. So um, three probably obvious uh, ways to answer this is you can, um, you can containerize some OpenStack services and uh, like leave outside all the third party services and some services of OpenStack that you don't want to containerize. So you might want to containerize only the API nodes, the like API services, like Nova API or Glance API, Cinder API, et cetera. Um, because those are the, probably the ones that will give you less trouble uh, whenever you want to upgrade them, whenever to, you want to scale your environment, and whenever you want to like, create configuration files, et cetera, for them. Those are, those are the ones that are probably easier to, to maintain. And, and if, if you go down this road, that means that you're going to leave the more complex um, services outside and like Nova Compute and Cinder Volume and let those run in the host because you know how to run them already. This is assuming that you have um, already a, a, a OpenStack cluster running already. And, and you will leave like all the third-party servi services running on the host as well, um, like 
MariaDB or RabbitMQ. Um, because containerizing some of those um, uh, services that need, actually, that need to be highly available and that you need to provide some other um, guarantees for is, is, is harder when you try to move them into, into, doc, into Docker or even Kubernetes, uh, who's just now getting uh, the proper uh, semantics to um, support stateful um, applications. So this is one way. So it will give you a, a very hybrid like approach where you just have like the API services that you might want to um, scale more and leave the rest of the things on the host so you have more control and they are closer to the, to the metal, I guess. And then you can only containerize all the OpenStack services and leave the third party services um, outside containers. And again, you go ahead and you containerize um, all the API nodes, schedulers, et cetera, et cetera, and then you containerize also the Nova Compute nodes and, um, sorry, um, the Nova Compute uh, service and the Cinder, Cinder volume service. And then you live in the host um, services like uh, Libbird or um, OpenVSwitch or MariaDB, um, RabbitMQ, et cetera, et cetera. And um, what this gives you is more consistency because you know that all your OpenStack, everything that, every process that starts with OpenStack, so that is built by the OpenStack community, you know that you have all of them in containers and it gives you an extra consistency in your deployment. And then you know that all the third party services are running on the host. And this is not possible with every third party service side. This assumes that if you're doing this, this assumes that you can talk to these this, uh, third party services using the network because you cannot. Um, if you're containerized, and unless you're running stuff in Docker, uh, but again, I'm trying to keep this as, as technology agnostic as possible, but unless you're running things in Docker that you're, you don't really uh, want to um, access the host directly from, from the runtime from the container. So, um, and and the, third, the third option is containerizing everything. You just put OpenStack and all the third-party services in containers. And this is probably, this is probably the hardest option because that means that you now have to figure out how to containerize uh, MariaDB, RabbitMQ, and, and all the third-party services like Liberty and OpenVSwitch, um, which, is, um, which is a problem solved for some of them because people have done it already in other deployments but, and, and with other tools. But for other, for other services, it's actually not a solved problem and, and uh, it's something that the community, the OpenStack community has also worked on and tried to figure out in the best way possible. So, um, we, we like hard challenges, I guess, and that's, this is the option that we actually went with. And, and I guess one of the motivations behind this is, is mostly like consistency. Like we, we want to eventually be able to have a fully continuized open tag deployment, including, including third party services, and so that we have like a very consistent, um, again, deployment that we can, um, that, that we can ship. And, you know, like, Eventually, all this can also like even run on a whatever like an atomic host or something like that that it only has and only supports containers. So that is like kind of like the mindset where you can even have your own like self-installing container that will uh, do some magic stuff. But anyway, there's a there is a way far in the future. What I want to say is that this is the option we went with, uh, mostly striving for consistency and and trying to unify uh, the tools as much as possible and. And B also have some overlap with what other tools in the community are doing. Uh, o is not the only tool doing this in the OpenStack community. So one thing that we actually wanted uh, was uh, to be able to um, collaborate with these other communities in, in as much as possible. Also, I'm over-caffeinated and I'm on a sugar rush, so <laughs> I might talk more than usual. Um, how, how, do, how are we gonna do this? So this is probably the fun part of the entire presentation, I hope. And because this is where, this is where the actual lessons learned. And I don't think that this, this list is, is exhaustive or anything, but uh, these are the ones that I remembered uh, being um, problems or causing discussions among um, the team and, and upstream in the mailing list. Uh, so let's forget the tools for a second. Let's forget that this is triple O and uh, let's forget that there are other tools doing um, the same thing. And let's like review a little bit the architecture and how you want to uh, do this thing. So one of the things uh, that we, we learned, but kind of like we didn't really fail here because we were, we were already doing it um, as part of, of the bare metal deployment um, we using triple O. But one of the things you want to keep in mind is you want, you want to label your nodes. This is something that you can mostly 
almost all CEOs have, like you can put names and, and labels on, on, on your notes and have sets of notes that you will consider compute notes and have sets of notes that you will consider, consider volume or storage or whatever. Um, do it. Don't, don't, if you're running this on Kubernetes, for instance, don't, don't just run your Kubernetes cluster and just throw um, OpenStack services at it and say, like, hey, just go and be smart about it, because Kubernetes is not going to be smart about it. Uh, you know OpenStack, you know where you want to run your services, and you know that Nova Compute should run in the node where you want to have your virtual machines. Or that is probably the recommended way to do it. And it doesn't really exactly have to be that way. But that's what you probably want to do. That's because more, um, because if that knows, um, if the Nova, if you don't do that, and then the Nova compute goes down, then you have like a very inconsistent deployment where there are some virtual machines that are running, but Nova compute uh, is not responding. And then you don't even know the state is basically broken. It's kind of like, in my mind, when I think about compute, I think, uh, I think about Nova compute and everything that Nova compute depends on. So that's, what, what, that's how I like to see this. Um, and it's just make it simpler to um, architect the entire deployment. So label your nodes. Make sure that you, uh, you use enough um, labels so that you can also tell um, your COE, in, assuming that you're using a COE. This, is, this doesn't really work on, uh, with, doesn't really work with Docker unless you have another tool that will do that for you. But if, if you're using a COE like Kubernetes, um, you want to tell Kubernetes how to run the services. But you want to also use enough labels so that you don't have to tell, so that you can explicitly tell Kubernetes where to run the service instead of telling Kubernetes where not to run a service. What does it mean? Um, it means that if you're running, if you're labeling, if you only label your compute nodes, that means that all, for running your API nodes, you will probably have to tell Kubernetes, run these services in all the, um, the nodes that are not compute. You, you want to give it like, like probably positive filters or, or segments to, uh, to the COE when, whenever you're running the, the service. So you want to tell it, go and run this service in the API level nodes instead of telling it, go and run the services in the nodes that are not compute. Um, so just be smart about the labels and try not to um, overdo them. I think I even have a slide about overdoing uh, labels. Um, one service per container. Uh, we have one service per container, and when I say one service, I, know, I don't mean Nova, Glance, Cinder. What I mean is Nova API is one container, Nova Scheduler is one container, Nova Compute is another container, Liberty is another container. Uh, so we have every service in a single container because we want them to be isolated from each other so that we'll have uh, more control over a single service, over, over each one of these services whenever it comes to you. Um, whenever we have to manage the entire cluster. So this also makes, um, I believe, simpler uh, the config generation, because you know you want to generate in that container, you want to generate the configuration files for that specific service, and you don't need to generate configuration files um, um, for, for more than one service, because you have them bundled in the same container. And also makes updating the image easier, because, <coughs> excuse me, because if you have a, if you have two services in the same container, um, say like libvirt running with Nova Compute in the same container, um, you and, and there's a new version of libvirt, you'll be forced to also restart the Nova Compute uh, Compute service whenever you want to up, up, upgrade um, libvirt. The same thing happens if you want to upgrade Nova Compute and you don't really want to upgrade Liberty. So have a single service per container because it gives you more control. It's like having, it's like having like a package per service in a, in a bare metal uh, deployment, I guess. So. Um, avoid containers placement as much as possible. I know I just said uh, label your nodes and tell your COE how to and where to put your containers and where to run them. But if you're using a COE, in the case you're using a COE, like Kubernetes, uh, one of the reasons for using a COE is so that it'll schedule services for you. Because the scheduler, the, the Kubernetes scheduler is supposed to be smarter than you. And, but not, it, don't, it not always happens. And, but if you rely on it and you just tell it to go and run uh, some of the services without telling it exactly where to run them, it'll balance the load and it'll try to run the services in the, um, in the nodes that have, um, they're not extra, 
extremely loaded, I guess, or overloaded with work. Um, and it'll help you scale them um, horizontally. And it will give you the flexibility that we also talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so telling, like placing services manually um, is not, it's not really bad, but uh, it's also not good to overdo that. And it would be better just to let the COE uh, make some decisions by itself um, using the data that it has and the status of the cluster and the, the health checks and the state of the entire thing, the entire deployment. So try not to be extra, like, you know, try to, try not to be smarter than the COE, I guess, in some of these um, operations. Um, separate the bootstrap tasks. So one thing that if you've, <coughs> if you run, well, actually, not, not, it's not really specific to OpenStack services. Like most of the services that you run, like databases, like OpenStack services, they have like some bootstrap operations that you need to go through whenever you want to run them for the first time. So if you want to run Nova, um, you, you're probably going to install Nova first, and then you'll have to create a database for Nova, and eventually you'll have to synchronize the database. And then, and only then, you'll be able to run Nova. And I'm pretty sure I'm missing some steps in between. But, um, but there's this list of tasks, there's this list of operations that you have to go through before you're able to run this service. This is what I consider, this is what we call the bootstrap task for these services. And most of them, if not all of them, have them. Um, a list for synchronizing the database. So you gotta run them at some point. If you have your service containerized and you don't have it um, installed in your bare metal, uh, you, you'll have to figure out a way to run these bootstrap stacks, tasks from the container itself, which means, so when you install Nova, it'll install a tool that will help you synchronize the database, right? If you don't have it in bare metal, that tool is inside a container. And one solution that some people have um, adopted is, well, you know, like when you run the container, uh, we'll check whether this, uh, this task and this tool have been, um, have been run already. And if it hasn't been run already, then we'll run it and eventually we'll just run the service. Um, and it'll do that in a single operation. You don't want that. You don't want that because it is not, <laughs> it'll be really extremely hard to uh, guarantee the consistency of your cluster if you do that. And because sometimes there might be race conditions if you run the containers at the same time. They might try to synchronize the database at the same time. So you want to have control over these bootstrap operations. You want to run them in very specific times. You want, they are bootstrap operations, right? You want to run them once, when you install the service, and probably once when you're doing upgrades. Other than that, you just want to run the freaking service. Um, so keep them in separate tasks. And what we do now, uh, what, what, the way we are doing it in, in Triple O right now is we reuse the same container because it is the one that has the tools. And what we do is we run the container with the bootstrap operations, and we basically override the entry point so that we can run the bootstrap operations, and once those operations have been run, those, once those tasks have been run, we then run the actual um, service. Sometimes we are able to actually run them in parallel because, like, if you run Glance API, um, it, it, it's going to be fine. I mean, unless you try to query the API, it's going to be fine to just run Glance API before you run the sync the sync DB. But again, like, we try to keep an order so that. Um, we follow like the same consistent architecture for all the services. So first run all the bootstrap tasks and eventually um, run the container. And you have to run this task manually using your tool, whatever tool it is that you're using. Uh, don't, don't put everything in the, same, in the same entry point for the container because um, that's not going to end well. Structure your images. We're, so for, for this thing, we're actually using Cola images. And um, the Cola images have a, have a, they have a, like a great structure. Um, when I say structure, I actually mean layers. Um, you, can lay, you can have different layers in your, in your container images. And this is something you really want. Because so you, you can install common packages in the, in, the, in the base layers of your images and eventually just install the service specific packages at the very top of the, um, at the topmost layer of your image. You want to do this so that you avoid um, recreating 
all the images every time. So the problem with this structure, though, is that if you need to upgrade, I don't know, one of the base packages uh, that are in the first or the second layer, you'll end up having to update all your images. And right now, I don't remember the number exactly, but I think we're over 120 images for, uh, for OpenStack, uh, for base OpenStack deployment. So there's a, like, a, like a zillion of images, really. Like, if, if you try to, if you run call a build, it'll take two to probably three hours to actually build them all from scratch. So if you update one of the packages at the base layer, you'll end up having to run all the builds for all the images, and that's going to take some time. Um, but you do want to have some, some, some structure in your images so that you can control what, what goes into each layer, and, and you know what you're going to uh, deploy at a very specific time. And then you can have different versions. And it's very, it's very interesting how the layers work for, for, for the container images. Um, you don't want to abuse mounts, um, which we're actually kind of doing. So you can, it's, it, is, it is very easy when, once you have the containers and you, you run them and you need to solve some of the problems like, like, acts, like if you're running, if you are migrating from a bare metal deployment into a containerized deployment and you already have your database running on bare metal and then you want to run the container with MariaDB, um, there's a question of how do I migrate the data from, uh, from the bare metal node into whatever storage container that I want to use for my containerized MariaDB. That is a, that is a question that uh, needs to be answered. And one is the solution is just mount varlib MySQL into the new container and let it access it, right? So it's very easy. It is it's probably dirty, but it works. And since it is easy to do that when you're using Docker, at least, um, it might be easy to also do the same thing for many other things that you will, ha you will need access for uh, from, the, uh, from the container. Um, and one of the things that happened to us is that we ended up adding more and more and more mounts and bind mounts into the container. And now we have, I believe, like we have many of them for different reasons, which like details that I really don't want, like, don't, don't want to get into right now. But if you happen to be doing this, try to avoid using or abusing of the mounts and the bind mounts that you can put in a container. One reason you want to avoid this is because if you eventually decide to move from whatever, like, whatever container runtime you're using, like Docker, for instance, if you ever decide to move from that into a COE like Kubernetes, then you'll have a huge problem uh, because you're not supposed to be accessing the host path from the container. And if you do that, and, and Kubernetes decides to just schedule your container somewhere else, your MariaDB container, into a node that doesn't have the data, then you'll try to access virally MySQL in a container that doesn't have your data. So that is a huge problem that is not going to be um, solved by just accessing the data from the host. So if you're not planning to ever move into a um, dynamic scheduling um, 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 service like Kubernetes, um, then I think you'll, you'll be fine. But again, like, try not to abuse them. Because eventually, unless your, your deployment tool is extremely smart, eventually you'll want to, to move to something else and, and let the COE uh, make some decisions for you and have that flexibility, again, like, that we talked about um, a little bit earlier. Um, you want to set the host name in the container. Uh, this, is, this was not extremely obvious to us, I think, or we just, it just slipped our minds. When, when we were um, doing the first implementation. And we run into issues when we're, we're, we're using Puppet to, to do some stuff in, in O, And I don't remember exactly whether it was a Puppet issue or whether it was some, some other issue, but it happened to us that we were not really setting the host name. And when we were running, when we ran the, uh, the synchronization tasks and we tried to access the database to actually, when we tried to access the database to create the database for each service, and this was done by Puppet, now I remember. Um, and um, we, well, the connection was failing because it was trying to use the host name, which was not set in the container. So remember to set the host names. If you need and you can use the DNS, it's even better. Uh, but if, you, if you're not using a DNS and you just want to rely on your host names, it's perfectly fine. Just remember to set them. It is important for your networking and your container life. Um, 
generate config files uh, from the container. So I guess this is the only slide that I have that is very specific to uh, to triple O and the way we do things. But I think it is valuable to also mention what you know the solution we we adopted here. And so one of the problems when uh, using when you know working on deployment tools is actually generating the config files that will then be used by the services to to run properly. And we're using, like I said, we're using Puppet for that in, in triple O. And uh, the first solution that we adopted for, so one of the things that, so Puppet needs the, the software to be installed, uh, installed in the container or in the host to actually be able to generate the config files. So one of the problems we had is that if you try to generate the config files for a service that is not installed, then it's not going to be able to do it. One solution we adopted in the very beginning was we'll have this, con this single container that we call agent, where we're going to install all the OpenStack services, and we'll keep all the config files in there so that whenever we run Puppet in that container, it'll be able to generate the config file, and then we'll copy those config files into the right containers. It is kind of like confusing, but there was this, like, this master, co well, actually, agent co uh, container that had all the config files. It, it really, like, it worked well for, for a single service. <laughs> then it, it just, like, didn't scale very well. One of the reasons is that if you ever need to upgrade your container, um, or, or your OpenStack cluster, and you, you want to update, like, I don't know, like the Nova API service, you will also have to update your agent container because you need to update the config files in the agent container and regenerate the config files and then copy those into the, uh, the new Nova uh, container that you're running. So what we did is, uh, this was actually Dan's idea, uh, what we did is we, we ditched that agent container and we are just, we install Puppet in every container as the, in, in, at the very base um, layer of, of the container image. We install Puppet there. And what we do is like whenever we need to generate a config file, we just use, we, we use the same container image that we use to run the services, but we just call Puppet inside the container. It generates a config file for that service, for that specific version, and it does it once. And then we just reuse that config file in that same container. So it solves a lot of the problems that uh, we had with the whole. And I mean, like, we, we want to simplify upgrades. And using the agent container was actually just going to make it more complex, um, which is something I really, really didn't want to do. So this worked very well for us. I'm pretty sure if you're using different technologies, you're not going to need a solution like this. But if you ever run into a similar problem, this is something that uh, you could actually do, and it works pretty well. <coughs> logging. Oh my god, logging. Um, when, we, when we started running the containers, actually, it was, um, we, we started, like, we got to the point where we were running all the containers, and we said, okay, containers are running. Now let's see if the services are actually running and the services are actually responding as they should be responding. And very few of them were. And then the problem is, you know, how do we figure out what's going on in the container, what, what we, uh, you know, fucked up, I guess. And we, what, one of the things we've, we found out is that when you got into the container is we, we, did, we actually didn't have good logging because the config files that we were generating were, uh, were based on our old bare metal uh, deployment, which means that they were all configured to log into var log. And when you run a service in container, like the standard way of doing it, the recommended way of doing things is that you will have your process logging into standard output, and then you can just access that log uh, using the Docker tools and stuff like that. Um, which was not the case for our services because they were configured to just log into var log, and which meant that we had to uh, get into the container every time, go and read the log files whenever, if they were there, because sometimes they weren't even there because you know the, the user that was running the service inside the container actually didn't have permissions to create the file, so it was like it was a mess. Um, so I guess what I want to say is that. There are different, there's not a standard way or a consistent way to do um, logging in an OpenStack deployment, not that I'm aware of. I mean, most of the services just log to var log. Most of the deployments that I know of, they just log to var log. There are other deployments that use login services like Fluent D, 
um, or an entire elk stack uh, to store the logs, which is, which is per perfectly fine. And when you're moving things to containers, you, I, I, this is not what we're doing, but I truly believe you want to, uh, you want to have like a hybrid kind of like solution. You want to log into standard output and also log into a file so that you won't uh, change entirely the way that your deployment works right now. And this is one of the other cases where we, we abused of the mounts because we basically got them, we basically mounted var log inside a container so that we would, you know, still log into var log inside a host. And we would be able to reuse all the tools that we had already to analyze um, the, the, the OpenStack deployment. I'm not saying this is going to stay like that, but this is another solution that you have. Recommended way is if you can log into standard output and also have your log files, that is probably the best way to do it. You can have like a um, data container where all your log files go and also have um, the services log into standard output. And this is great because then you can have other tools, like I mentioned before, like FluentD going through the containers and collecting all the logs for you and having them centralized in a single place if you really want. Or you can have like eventually like even have like the same OpenStack service login straight to you. Uh, to find it. And I think there's a plugin that you can put in the container runtime that uh, will just do it automatically for you. And that is a bit of a digress. But anyway, yeah, just bear in mind that login to send our output is great, but I would also um, keep logging to files because there are many tools that just parse files and, and analyze them in a proper way, which is at least the tools that we were using. And I guess one of the biggest questions is um, whether to COE or not to COE. Um, so COE stands for con um, Containers Orchest Orchestration Engine, um, aka Kubernetes and services alike. Um, so you would, you have your container, you, uh, you tell this tool, this COE, to please run that container and it'll um, dynamically schedule the container for you. So one of the big questions is whether to go into some tool like this or just going to a simple um, container runtime like Docker or a Rocket. And this really depends on your taste on really what you want to do. Uh, just bear in mind if you, if you decide to use a container runtime and not depend on any COE, you'll lose some of the flexibility that we talked about before. Uh, unless your deployment tool is smart enough to provide that flexibility uh, to you. Um, so you're not, you cannot tell, unless you're using Docker Swarm, but you, cannot, you can't tell Docker to just please go and dynamically schedule a container for you. You can tell a Docker daemon to run the container for you in that specific node, but you cannot give a Docker daemon a set of, class, a set of nodes and tell it to just please run the container in some of these nodes and you decide what the best way to run it is. Uh, which is something you can, use, you can do with Kubernetes or Docker Swarm or um, some other COEs. So our decision was we want to eventually run everything on a COE, um, Kubernetes, but before we get there, we're, we're just going to start with Docker and start migrating bare metal deployments into, into container runtimes. And eventually, when, once we've figured out some of the basic um, difficulties and challenges that there are with running OpenStack on containers, then we're going to start uh, the migration into um, specific uh, COEs. Um, things that we still haven't figured out quite yet. Um, I think there's just one, actually. Um, this is the only one that, I, that came to mind, is choosing the right storage driver. Uh, like I said, like the first phase we're using, uh, we're mostly using Docker. One thing that we have not figured out yet is what, what's the best the storage driver for this. Like, there are good documentations. We kind of know what storage driver is. So you can have different storage drivers for uh, Docker. And the device mapper is the default one, which basically writes uh, things into a loop device, which is extremely slow and is not good for, for production. But you have other options there, like um, there's one that runs on ButterFS, and there's another one that uses Overlay to there, there are different drivers with uh, different performances and different uh, recommendations for different environments, like production, development, testing, et cetera. There are some that are faster but less reliable. There are some others that are more reliable but a little bit uh, slower. So 
which one is the best one? Uh, probably overlaid to is the answer there, but there is uh, we I don't I don't believe we've done enough um, test on on this on on the CI environments upstream to actually have proper numbers to to back this uh, this statement. And with that, I that's it. Um, these are all the things that I believe um, were relevant to mention here, and and that I think that are great, and we learned um, in the last. What, six months, seven months? I don't know. Um, not, not really long, but yeah. So, do you have any questions? There's hey, one. I have a question. Could you uh, kind of summarize the current state in terms of what's working, what's not working, what's targeted for which release? So, um, I believe so the OpenStack deployment, the over cloud deployment is actually. So we're able to deploy the under cloud on containers. The over cloud deployment is actually working. Uh, the CI is broken right now. I think um, as of last week it broke. But we've we've been able to run over containerized over clouds already. The target is to release all that uh, during um, what what release are we in? Pike? Yeah, in Pike. And uh, we want to release all that um, uh, by the end of this uh, development cycle. And the key thing is migrating all the bare metal uh, deployments into a containerized one so that we don't have to support two. And of course, not break existing deployments or, or backwards compatibility, which is a um, key thing that we want to preserve in Triple O. Anyways. All right. I think there's another question. Yeah. Are you going to use uh, the COE to replace high availability services like Pacemaker? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, and I forgot to mention Pacemaker, actually. So I think for now, for Pike at least, we're, we're, the, the aim is to um, actually containerize pay, Pacemaker or use Pacemaker remote for controlling um, some of the HA dependent uh, services like MariaDB, RabbitMQ, et cetera. And I don't know, hopefully, when we move to the COE, yes, uh, the goal is to replace uh, Pacemaker entirely and just rely on the HA capabilities of the CIA. Okay. I had uh, one more question about sure. the, uh, are you using load balancing on services like RabbitMQ when you containerize them? Um, yeah, right. So we're keeping the same architecture for, for, the, for the Pike release, at least. We're keeping the same architecture as we have for, for bare metal. So yes is the answer. And whenever we move to the COE, then again, we we'll rely on, on whatever is available in the COE itself, like Kubernetes. You're very welcome. There's one more question. Um, are you working with uh, the Atomic project yet? I saw in the slides there for a second for kind of the containerized operating system. Yeah, I mean, like eventually, when, whenever we manage to containerize everything, uh, you would be able to run OpenStack on Atomic, uh, in theory. I think we've done it, actually. Well, it, it won't work anymore, because now we're depending on some stuff that runs on the, on the host. But eventually, yes, you'll be able to do that. You should be able to do that, yeah. Not for Pike, though. Just want to clarify that. Any more questions? All righty. Well, thank you.